all go. Excellent. Let's make sure everyone at home can tune in. A serious problem. Second Corinthians uh, 13 and verse 5 reads, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, indeed, you are disqualified. Nothing is more treacherous than the deceitfulness of sin. It deludes, it blinds, and ultimately it leads us to destruction. You know, Satan doesn't come at us with a multitude of temptations all at once. He disguises temptations uh, with a semblance of good. And, you know, sometimes uh, we mask them ourselves with a, a semblance of good, don't we? We take one step ready for the next. Satan watches to see his bait taken so readily. He watches to see souls walking in the very path that he has prepared for them. While on this pathway, we are wholly unfit for the powerful use by the Holy Spirit. The difficulty we face is with this fact established by inspiration and by our own experience that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Of course, the next verse goes on to tell us that God knows it. Um, unconverted hearts love to find ways to justify sin. It's not that bad. Maybe you've said that in your mind once or twice. Most Christians do it. I'll sort it out soon. When I have a more convenient time, when I'm not so busy, I'll take care of that. And my personal favorite, I'm a work in progress. Uh, God is still working on me. I'll get there eventually. Sin that is not repented of obviously has dire consequences, doesn't it? A very well-known passage. How's everyone temperature-wise? All right? Okay. Um, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What a horrible situation. Horrible situation for Jesus, uh, but a particularly horrible situation for those people, isn't it? Um, here's a group of people who have all, almost all, the outward appearances of a Christian life. But what does Jesus say to them? Depart from me. That's hard, isn't it? Um, so what is their fate according to this verse? Yeah. Um, do you suppose that these people knew their true condition? No. No, it doesn't look like it, does it? That's right. Yeah, deceived. That, that's, that's probably the best word for it. Um, they didn't know their true condition because here they are saying, oh Lord, we have done all these wonderful things. They think they're all right. Yeah. Another similar passage uh, which Julie shared this morning, uh, the message to the lukewarm church, the Laodicean church, says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Here is Jesus' message to the church of our time. We've studied this before a number of times. We've looked at it. 
It's pretty similar to that last passage, isn't it? Um, Jesus says a similar thing to them. He says, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. What is their fate at that time? Destruction. It's not good. Um, Do these people know their true condition? No, they're blind. As Colin said, deceived. Here's another verse along the same lines. So blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Those who are outside the city are those who have decided to hold on to their sins rather than give them to Jesus. With all those cheery verses out the way... <laughs> Sorry, but they are pretty heavy, but um, the Bible is replete with um, similar sorts of warnings. Um, unconfessed sin isn't just a problem for salvation, although obviously it is. It is a problem for the Holy Spirit to be able to use us. Our sin that is held on to separates us from God. It separates us from God, the Holy Spirit. We cannot be fully used by God. We cannot serve God when we are serving a different master. Because we are told, do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. We've been studying about the 10 days in the upper room. We've been working through that book slowly, 10 days in the upper room. We're looking at that time period that preceded the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. We're slowly working through the different aspects of that upper room experience. Jesus gave this promise and instruction. He said, we read, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Before ascending to heaven, Jesus gave a promise and an instruction here that the disciples were to wait in Jerusalem until they had received the special baptism of the Holy Spirit. During those 10 days in the upper room, they drew closer to Christ, and consequently, they drew closer to each other. And then after that experience, we have this picture. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. That's a vastly different picture to what uh, we, we've been looking at uh, the last few weeks. You know, it wasn't that long ago we were reading about the disciples who were striving for a more prominent place in Christ's kingdom. Even just a few, a few short weeks uh, before this, um, we have a picture of the, the disciples after the crucifixion. Uh, they were fearful. Uh, they didn't know what was going on. They were despondent. They were hiding away. Uh, but here we have a, a very different picture. Just you know, This is just a, a month and a half uh, after time spent with Jesus and time spent in the upper room. Although the Bible doesn't give us a detailed account of what took place in the upper room, It provides us with enough information to develop an outline of what may have actually taken place. We know that there was a decided change uh, between the disciples uh, immediately post the crucifixion and the disciples after this upper room experience. They had gone from being fearful to being fearless. Uh, They had gone from an inward focus 
uh, worrying about themselves, uh, worrying about where they would be and uh, what they would get. Uh, though they've gone from being uh, concerned about their safety, uh, their position, uh, to being concerned about only one thing. As we read through the book of Acts, we see that uh, their only concern is the sharing of the gospel. And that's what it's all about. Uh, during this time, I'd like to put to you that there was a cleansing of their hearts. Uh, jealousies were laid aside, strife was banished, and the conflicts between them were resolved. Um, the barriers were broken down, so to speak. The 10 days in the upper room were days of deep, earnest prayer, reflection, and heart searching. Days of reflection, self-examination. In the book Evangelism, uh, we read that after Christ's ascension, the disciples were gathered together in one place to make humble supplication to God. And after 10 days of heart searching and self-examination, the way was prepared for the Holy Spirit to enter the cleansed, consecrated soul temples. The disciples wanted to be sure that there were no attitudes or habits left in their lives that would hinder the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We know that the job of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin. We read about that in John 16. So it's little wonder uh, that there was heart searching and deep reflection going on in the upper room, a true repentance. And I want you to put this at the back of your mind uh, for those of you who are coming along to the afternoon study, uh, that before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, uh, there was deep heart searching, deep reflection, and there's a real, a real drawing close to God. We'll discover this afternoon that a similar thing takes place before Jesus returns. A similar series of events uh, before the outpouring of the latter rain, that is, the final outpouring of the Holy Spirit to prepare the world for Jesus' return. Uh, it's a, a mirror of what took place before Pentecost. Searching our hearts. Throughout the Bible, uh, there is this repeated call and, you know, we say we, you know, we don't want to look to ourselves. That's not what this is about. Uh, but there is a repeated call to spend time examining our hearts. Uh, we see this especially in the book of Psalms. Uh, again and again. Uh, David invites the Lord here. He says, examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my mind and my heart. For your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. How often do we invite God to do the same for us? Maybe not that often. Um, maybe we don't feel we could say, I've walked in your truth. It's interesting to note that he says, Your loving kindness is before my eyes. We have to ask ourselves, what are we keeping before our eyes? Um, psalm 26 is, is a really good psalm, and I would encourage you, if you have time this afternoon, uh, to read through it. I uh, Read through it and um, try and make it your own. I think it's a, a good, good prayer psalm, a good passage to pray through. It can be easy to spot things on the surface, I think most of us are aware of our outward actions, our outward sins normally. Um, but we are encouraged in Scripture to look deeper than what happens on the outward. We read in Hebrews, to pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up, cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled. What do roots produce? Plants, trees, and uh, generally speaking, what do plants produce? Fruit. Fruit, <laughs> Fruit don't they? 
Now, if there is a root of bitterness in your heart, it will produce perhaps shoots of anger, uh, criticism, maybe gossip. The fruits of those things are things like broken relationships. If we have a root of ungratefulness, what might that grow into? Hate. Yeah. We might k- entitlement. We might covet things. The fruit of which also not good. What about pride? If we have roots of pride in our heart. Yeah. Bold ego. Self-sufficiency. We think we can do it all by ourselves. Yeah. Uh, if we have pride in our heart, it can grow into those things. And the fruits, well, we've seen the fruits of pride, haven't we, in Scripture. Uh, we see that that was the original problem. Uh, iniquity was found in Satan's heart, wasn't it? Because uh, of pride. Self-examination is not merely looking at our actions, but asking God to shine a light in the dark, in the dark recesses of our hearts, to see what could be growing there. You see, God's law doesn't concern itself with just the outward conduct. Instead, Jesus made it very clear that wrong thoughts, desires, and designs are encompassed in the Ten Commandments, didn't he? What did Jesus say constituted murder? Hate. And what constituted adultery? Lust. Through his grace, it's made a way for all of us to overcome, to uproot these things that are growing in us. It is this heart change which is at the very core of the new covenant. Uh, We get new roots put into our heart. In Hebrews, we read about that. It says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. If we allow it, God will give us new roots in our hearts that will produce the fruits of the gospel. We need to take time to ask him. David makes it clear that this exercise isn't about fault-finding, but rather a step forward. We read in Psalm 139, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me on the way in the way everlasting. When we ask God to point out sins in our lives, not just the fruit but the very root of those sins, we're asking him to turn us, to lead us in the way everlasting. Uh, Let's turn to Psalm 19 if you have your Bibles. I know I've got most of the uh, verses up on the screen but if you've got your Bibles... uh, We'll look up this one passage because it's a slightly longer one. You see, Psalm 19 that was, when the Spirit of God reveals to us the full meaning of the law, that it concerns the roots as well as the fruits, a change takes place in our hearts. Uh, when we look at the, what the prophet, when the prophet Nathan pointed out the sins in David's life, uh, if you're familiar with that, that story, uh, Nathan came to David and, and, and in a very uh, creative way pointed out the sins in David's, hearts, in David's heart, just one heart. Um, not only did it make David aware of what he was doing wrong, but it helped him in putting them away. David accepted um, Nathan's counsel. Uh, he accepted it meekly and he humbled himself before God. Um, Perhaps this is why uh, David wrote in Psalm 19, starting in verse 7. He said, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. That's what it does, doesn't it? Enlightens our eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. 
More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. That's a good summary. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. I think that's a really good picture of the function of the law. An un unsearched heart is a real hindrance to our work. In the book uh, Christ's Object Lessons we are given a practical example of self-examination and re this is uh, reflecting on the parable of the lost coin. It reads, in the family if one member is lost to God every means should be used for his recovery. On the part of all the others, let there be diligent, careful self-examination. Let the life practice be investigated. See if there is not some mistake, some error in management by which that soul is confirmed in impenitence. Basically, she's saying, see if there isn't something wrong in you, uh, something that you have done wrong that has led to this. Now, we have seen how the preparation, the reflection, the prayer, the hearts searching in the upper room prepared the way for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we know that the purpose of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was uh, to share the gospel. We read in, in this passage, uh, in, in this uh, quote, that the same process needs to take place in our homes and in our church. You know, if there are people we are struggling with, to reach, if there are people we're struggling to reach, uh, struggling to share Jesus with, it is possible that the problem lies with us. You know, th that's an unpleasant thought. I find it unpleasant. Uh, you know, it could be that the problem is with us. I'm not saying that that's always the case, but according to this, it's a possibility. Um, it's something that we should ask God to show us. You know, perhaps we might have a root of arrogance in our heart. Uh, perhaps we don't display the Bible truths that we have with love as we are instructed to. You know, if people are watching you, people are scrutinizing your life, whether you realize it or not. They are looking to see, does Jesus really make a difference? You know, maybe you're just attending uh, this church, but people know that you come along and attend. So they're thinking, they're asking themselves, do Seventh Day Adventists really live up to all that I'm watching on First Light or on Hope Channel? Are they actually living up to the light they claim to have? Or are they just like everyone else? Our friends and neighbours and our workmates are watching us, making their judgment about whether they should investigate Jesus. You know, oftentimes the most important gospel presentation we can make is the life that we live. I think that is a, a sobering uh, reflection. There are several reasons why we neglect this preparation, this heart-searching work. Firstly, it's unpleasant, it's not nice, um, at least the initial process. Uh, I think that goes without saying. No one likes having their issues pointed out, um, but it is absolutely necessary. Uh, Jesus gives a, a pretty graphic warning <laughs> in this passage. He says, And whoever falls on this stone, speaking of himself, will be broken. But on whomever it forms, it will grind him to powder. We have two choices. We can go through this process 
have God search our hearts, that is, we can fall on Jesus and be broken, or we can have the alternative, which is not a pretty picture. The second reason why we perhaps neglect this heart-searching work is that we don't see the promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as applying to us. We leave it back at Pentecost uh, for Bible times, you know, maybe for the times of the, the church fathers. and you know, um, But we don't apply it to us. But the truth is, it's applicable to all Christians, especially to us now as we get close to Jesus' return. The third reason, I think, uh, that we neglect this work is that we don't see the need of it. Or we don't feel the need of it. We don't feel the need of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I like the Laodicean church. We're too comfortable. And, but we don't realize the spiritual drought that we're in. And perhaps, I think most practically and um, maybe most importantly, um, we don't make the time for it. Instead, we have minor matters that occupy our, our attention. We don't make the time for it. Um, this is not something that you can say a quick prayer for and, and leave. Uh, this is something that, that takes time in prayer. It takes time by ourselves. Um, it takes time to ask God and to reflect on his word, uh, to reflect on ourselves and see if we're living up uh, to what God has in his word. I want to give you an illustration. I'm going to show you a picture. This is a picture of a shed. Not that you'd know it from looking at that picture. <laughs> yeah, Richard does. You might say, gosh, who would let their shed get that bad? I say, how dare you? That's my shed. Uh, over the years, things have built up. A box here, a tool there, a broken appliance over the back. One less, thanks to Richard taking that, that one away from, from me. Uh, an unfinished project over the back. This is sometimes the sort of thing that we can find in our hearts when we begin looking. See that device over the back? It's probably a little bit hard to see. Um, there's a camera jib hanging on the wall. Before I was a Christian, I studied filmmaking. I sometimes try to carry on with this, but God had a different plan. You know, sometimes we can hold on to des the desires of our previous lives rather than wholeheartedly following the new life that God has for us. We can hold on to those old things. See those pink bats there? We're partway through renovating our house. We've been partway through renovating our house for about five years years now, um, and these are just some leftovers, but I'll use them eventually. Um, since Evelyn came on the scene, um, that's all paused. Uh, it's paused, the renovations. You know, sometimes God calls us to change and renovate areas of our lives. Maybe he's asked you to get your health in order. You know, we start and then we drift back into old ways of doing things. And we need to ask God, have we done that? Have we drifted back? What's that? Oh, yeah. Um, box of books. Boxes of books. And they're not bad books, um, but just didn't deem them worthy to still be on the bookshelf inside. Um, they're not really relevant to our life at the moment. Um, you know, sometimes we hold on to things that we shouldn't, things that we should let go of. Um, maybe you feel that someone did you wrong in the past. Maybe even you don't understand why God allowed some horrible thing to happen and you haven't let go of that. You haven't given that back to him. Have a look at that lawnmower. It's actually a really good lawnmower um, and an, in, an inter interesting story behind how we got it and it's a testament to how... Um, if you are a faithful, not, not bragging on myself, but if you are faithful in, in your tithe, God rebukes the devourer. Um, 
we've had that lawnmower for about six years. It was second hand, well, second hand when we got in. We, had, we that'll testify, we absolutely thrash it. Um, we used, when we lived in Auckland, we used to mow uh, lawn that was, no exaggeration, that high, and we had four acres of it to mow. And we, we would do that, and um, it just kept on going and going and going, and it's kept on going. Uh, God looks after looks after these things and ensure that, ensures that they last, but that's not what I want to talk about. Notice the rust on the side. You know, I've been meaning to learn how to spray paint, um, but I haven't. Um, it really needs an oil change. I did it uh, when we bought it. Um, I even put an hour meter on it, you know, a little meter on the, the dash to tell me how many hours I've done. Uh, so, uh, so that I could do regular maintenance, that I might, you know, keep a log book or something. Um, it, it didn't help. It didn't help me do regular maintenance. It just it reminds me every time that I hop on it that, oh, I haven't done anything. <laughs> um, you know, God calls us to regular spiritual maintenance as well. Personal study and prayer, fasting, uh, self-examination. But sometimes, like the lawnmower, uh, things, these things can be neglected and our, our hearts end up looking like my shed. Just to clarify, um, this is not indicative of what our house looks like. Um, <laughs> Just <laughs> if Catherine's listening, um, it's not indicative of what our, our house looks like. Um, it just tends to be that when we renovate a room, stuff gets moved out to the shed and um, it never comes back in. Um, I am going to work on it because um, <laughs> it's not, not good to have it that way. Um, but that's what our hearts can start to look like. Don't misunderstand what I've shared today. Um, God does not want us to wallow in guilt or be filled with remorse about, about the stupid things that we have done or that we are doing. His goal is to lead us in the way everlasting. That's his goal for us. You know, it's healthy to reflect on our spiritual condition. That's a healthy thing to do. But it is unhealthy to dwell on past faults. I think our Jeremiah sums it up very well uh, in Lamentations. He says, let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. That's a good summary. Uh, in Psalm 119 we read, I thought about my ways and turned my feet to your testimonies. I made haste and did not delay to keep your commandments. You know, God is bigger than our mistakes. He's greater than our failures, although they may be many. He's greater than our mess. We need to know our condition. We have to know our condition. But it is more important to know the one who can change our condition. That's the most important thing. You know, understanding our weakness prepares us to receive his strength. Understanding our sinfulness prepares us to receive his righteousness. And understanding our ignorance uh, prepares us to s receive his wisdom. Uh, in 2 Corinthians, we read, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see, the weaker and more helpless you understand yourself to be, the stronger you will become in his strength. The heavier your burdens, the more blessed the rest when you cast them upon Jesus. The conviction of the Holy Spirit may bring us sadness over our fallen natures, but he does not leave us there. The purpose is to lead us closer to Jesus, to lead us in more reliance on him. We need to realize our greatest need is to attach ourselves to God. We cannot change ourselves. That is clear from the Bible. But the time we spend with God will plant and nourish that root of righteousness in our hearts.
And then this can be said of us. We can put ourselves in this passage. But the path of the just, you can put yourself in there. Iron, Richard, mum and dad, Jenna. The path of all of us. <laughs> no, no, just those people. <laughs> the path of the just is like the shining sun. That can be said about you. The path of of Barry and Julie, of Matthew, is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto that perfect day. As we go into this week, please prayerfully consider these questions. Is there anything lurking within my soul that would hinder me from receiving the fullness of the Holy Spirit? And also, is there anything in my soul that would hinder me from receiving the fullness of the Holy Spirit? Am I willing to give God permission to take anything out of my life that is not in harmony with His will? Now you can go ahead and stop the stream if you want, Peter. <laughs>